I mean, King Viserys, you know, of all the rulers that we've seen sit on that throne, I, I think has to be my favourite, because I think he's the only one who isn't despicably evil in some way. Like, he's a good man. Yeah. It's very rare in that world and in those stories that somebody on that seat is somebody that uh, isn't driven by power. And that was one of the things I really loved about the character, that um, people kind of perceived him as weak. But I, I loved those qualities about him, that he wasn't seduced by power and uh, he didn't abuse his privilege as a ruler either. He was very honourable about his history and where he was from and where he stood in the lineage. So um, I thought that was really different for that world, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Ryan, I mean, maybe you could give us a little insight into, uh, you know, how you wrote this kind of uh, extraordinary journey that um, uh, we go on in this season from really like, you know, Viserys' ascension to the throne all the way through to his death. Uh, what were you excited about with, it, with this character specifically? And, and um, you, you know, how did you structure that in such a way that like, you know, it didn't feel unsatisfying that we like with because there are so many like time jumps and all that kind of thing going on yeah i mean it was it was very tricky uh to structure all of that but we started with the, the desire to portray um this very complicated character who we always said was a, a really good man but was not a good king and the reason for that is because he actually is quite a modern politician he uh, he's not quick to move. He takes consensus. He finds the middle often, and that's those are just not aren't qualities that work in a feudal medieval society. But it's are things that we look for, I think, in our uh, contemporary leaders. And we were really excited to populate this world with a character like that. And you know, as Patty said, um, there's a certain uh, sort of weakness seen in that. Um, but we wanted to see that portrayed with strength. And, uh, and that was the, the, tr the tricky part, and that's the thing that you know, Patty did so wonderfully. He, he brought the dragon into the role and, um, and carried this burden uh, over, over these you know, the many years that we, we, uh, we followed him in, in, in the first story. So the trick was really to show this generational conflict that um, began with um, Viserys' generation. He, he and Otto Hightower his hand, and then was passed on down to their children, in Rhaenyra and Alicent, where they were young women and were used as pawns in this Game of Thrones. And then uh, and then, as they grew up and became uh, adults and then had children of their own, their own, how this bitter rivalry and this grasping for power gets passed on then to their children. So it's a three-generational story, and we needed to get through that in the course of one season so we can uh, get on to the, uh, to the Dance of the Dragons. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and Paddy, like I have to ask you, you know, I think we see very physically in Viserys the way that he is chipped away at by the people around him, you know, and, um, all the way to the end. Um, and, you know, we got a sense of that in that clip there. Um, how nice was it for you to finally get to act without makeup at the end there? Oh, very good. <laughs> no, but, but tell very me. good, Joe. <laughs> But tell me about that, that process. What, what did that do for you in kind of trying to in understanding where Viserys was at any minute, that you had this kind of physical transformation over the course of the Well, that was one of the things I really loved about it, was mapping that um, demise, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, what I found, I found the sadness in Viserys as well, that like Ryan said then, he's, he's a good man, but he's not particularly a great king, in a way. Um, I think he struggles from the beginning with that role and the crown's a really heavy burden. And to me, I, I think um, what was interesting about him was playing that sadness in him and the fact that in the very first episode his wife dies and um, because he chooses to try and save their child. And um, so she dies. It's kind of butchered in this process to try and save the child. And I think he carries the weight of that all through his story. And and. So when actually, you know, he's falling apart and he's, he's rotting and, he's, and his eye's missing and he, he's, he's not the one asking to be healed. He's not the one calling the maesters to heal him. Everybody else is, but he's, it's almost like he's accepted it. The burden of the crown was just too much for a man with a heart like that who, who couldn't be corrupted. Um, and I thought, and my first thing when I got the script was, like always, I went, 
Well, who's turned this down then? Because they must be mad. <laughs> but um, apparently they came to me with it first and I was just over the moon. I thought, well, this is just a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a gift and, I, and I, I always feel like that about him. I'm so grateful that he came to me. Well, and, and Ryan, I wonder if, like, you know, maybe we can embarrass Paddy a little bit here. Uh, what, what was it that made Paddy the obvious choice to play this role? Uh, I think, I, you know, I, it was this, it was this real kind of celestial moment. Not to get too kind of uh, woo woo about it, but um, we, it, you know, when you're casting a, a pilot or the first episode of a show, often these huge lists of actors are put in front of you, and and you know who do you like and who should we talk about? And uh, and it was funny because um, the uh, Kate Rose James, our casting director, played put this huge list in front of uh, Miguel and I, and, uh, and it was actually the first character that we, we talked about in the show, because he was the linchpin and the, you know, the sort of patriarch of the family. And, and it, it, it was a very, very eclectic list. It was the you know, people of all different ages and types and sizes. And literally both Miguel and I pointed at Patty's name uh, first on the list. He's the only person we ever talked about. He was the only person that we, we ever talked about the role with. And we both loved him from all the, you know, incredibly the kaleidoscope of work that he's done. Uh, comedic, dramatic, uh, uh, he's, you know, he's directed. I mean, just, we saw the range of, uh, and the the kind of pathos that he can he can bring to these characters. And it just, he just jumped off the page at us. And obviously we made the right choice. Absolutely, I'm sure everybody that's seen the show would agree. Right. Is it true, Paddy, that uh, George R. R. Martin paid you an extraordinary compliment? Yeah, yeah. He sort of said that, well, his words to me were, you, you know, you um, played, for, it was kind of like I played Viserys better than he ever imagined. And he just said, your Viserys is better than my Viserys. <laughs> but I think, you know, one of the quotes from George, who I get the odd text message from him every now and again, and which is a really great thing to wake up to. And he's the creator of the world, you know, and Ryan and everybody interpreted it all so well. But to get a, a nod from the creator like that, and for him to actually say that he now wants to go back and rewrite Viserys' history, um, that's really flattering. Um, you know, we did, when, the, when we first went to do a Comic-Con thing last year, um, there wasn't much excitement for Viserys Targaryen, you know, and in, in the books, he doesn't really have that same sort of journey in the same way. He doesn't have that same emotional impact. So it took a few episodes for people to really warm to him and um, until his final episode in eight. And I was just confused of why people didn't like him. I thought he was a great, great character. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I don't think there was any greater compliment than George himself, you know, messaging me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do have a bone to pick, Ryan, which was pointed out to me uh, backstage, and it hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me before. But, you know, we have this great uh, dragon rider, you know, the man who tamed Balerion, and he doesn't get much time to ride Balerion. What's that about? Well, Balerion's dead. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a big giant true. skull. Well, a dragon, then. He's a, skull. a dragon. So he talks to Balerion. Yeah. Like Hamlet, but that's uh, that's it. His dragon riding days are over. I'd have taken any dragon, Pete's dragon. <laughs> there has to be a spare dragon, dragon somewhere. Any dragon yeah. will do. <laughs> um, uh, Ryan, I wonder if I can ask. You know, you, you established the show uh, so brilliantly in, in, in this season, and and obviously it leaves. Uh, you know, the, the, well, it's Game of Thrones, so the question of succession now, and and and, and what happens next uh how, what are you excited about uh in, uh without obviously asking you for specifics about diving back into the second season of the show well i mean uh, i'm excited to pick up where we left off i mean uh, hopefully um we did you know we did the i think the hard uh complex work of setting up this entirely new dynasty and family and all the players in, in, uh, in season one and took the time to do all the character work with all the individuals so that you understood where everybody fell uh, along the line of, you know, are they on Allison's side of the equation, Egon's side, or are they on Rhaenyra's side and Damon's side? 
And um, the excitement now is that we get to kind of fall into the, uh, I think, more traditional rhythms of uh, storytelling in Game of Thrones and, uh, and get to see where, where that story is going to, where, where it's going to go. And we've always talked about this, um, this particular tale, and George has talked about this too, as being a Shakespearean tragedy or Greek tragedy. And um, whereas the original series is like this big sweeping epic fantasy, it's about light and darkness and, you know, ice and fire. Um, this series is very much about, you know, a, a house tearing itself apart from within. And um, now that all those pieces have been set on the board, I'm really excited to tell the next chapter to see what happens now that Viserys is gone and is no longer keeping uh, things, keeping the lid on to things. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Paddy, for you, you know, you invested so heavily in this character, I think. I mean, that's clear from, from, from the performance and from the, the way that you've talked about it. I wonder what it's going to, how, how you feel it's going to be for you now, just to be able to watch the show without having to take part in it, you know? I'm not watching it, I'm too jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too envious, you know? But no, it'd be great, I mean, you know, the, the, the great thing about it as well, there is a bit of a sadness when everyone's going back to work and you're not a part of that. Mm. Um, you know, and I did feel a little bit of envy with it, but the story was told, <laughs> and I'm glad that they, they didn't drag Viserys out because I, I think the fact that it was so sort of, you know, point to eight episodes, it, it just sort of made his arc all that much stronger. So, um, you know, I'm happy. I, I, I went in that world and did my thing and walked out of it again but I wish everybody the best I love everybody I've made so many friends on it you know Ryan's a great guy we've got to become friends he buys me nice presents every now and again don't you so um, yeah I just wish them all the best well guys uh, House of the Dragon fantastic show uh, see it now Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you want to support my channel, you can buy one of my graphic novels from the link below, or you can buy one of my t-shirts. And also remember to click on like and subscribe.